Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chip House. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at SharpSpring. And welcome to the 11th episode of the Agency Acceleration Series. It's gone so fast, we've been having a blast. If you are new to this series, uh, I just wanted to let you know. So this entire series is built for agencies like we've built our platform. So SharpSpring has built our business around agencies, helping them create new profit center for their business with our revenue growth platform helping them drive, drive new leads for themselves and their customers, uh, manage those leads in their business between their marketing and their sales team and convert those leads into to new revenue. And so our agencies are really important to us and agency content is really important to us. And our topic today is selling video services to clients and no pressure at all for me on video since I'm with one of the top YouTube stars out there and uh, really excited to talk to Amy Landino today. So many of you here are probably already fans of Amy, but if you don't know that much about her, she's an entrepreneur and she's a best-selling author, philanthropist, and the world's number one productive lifestyle coach. And she's the creator of the award-winning YouTube series called Amy TV, which I think has about 400,000 subscribers. She's author, author of Vlog Like a Boss and Good Morning, Good Life. And she's been featured in prestigious publications like Business Insider and Fortune and Entrepreneur, et cetera. And we are really excited to be able to offer Amy's book to uh, our attendees today. And you can get a signed copy of Amy's book. If you're curious about SharpSpring based on my short description there, um, you can get a signed copy of Amy's book, Log Like a Boss, and just let us know that you want a demo of SharpSpring and we're gonna put the link there in the chat and you can go ahead and sign up for a demo and get a copy of the book. Um, so how this works today is Amy has pre-shot um, a presentation on selling video services to client and kind of getting the most out of video. And I think you'll really enjoy it. And then we're gonna bring her up in about 15, 20 minutes and the rest of the session will be Q&A and I'll be answering, or I'll be asking Amy your questions. So please chat them in as you have them during this series. So uh, with that, we're gonna go ahead and bring up the video and I'll, I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Good morning, good life. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Amy Landino. I'm the founder of Aftermark, a video production company for large organizations and Gatlu House, which is my media company that allows me to teach women how to go after the life they want. I do a lot of video in my work. And so that is why I'm here talking to you today, because I know that you're probably considering video in your offering of services. So we want to talk about for your clients, how do we make video relevant for them? How do we have the conversation to get them interested in buying video services from you? And what are we actually going to do that's going to make the difference for them? That's going to make it worth the return on investment. There's a lot of stuff to go over today. And I'm really pleased that you decided to spend this time with me. So let's dive in. The first and most important question when it comes to selling the power of video is why video? Why are we having this conversation at all? And that may seem like a dumb question in 2020, but is it? Because if we don't actually think about the context of the platform and how it applies to everything that we want to do and the impact we want to have and the audience that we are talking to, um, it is a very good question. We need to know why we're going to do this because there will be more time, more resources that go into video than maybe some of the other mediums for creating content. A couple of stats for you to look at are available at sharpspring.com slash marketing dash statistics and let's start with influence for one one minute of video is more convincing 
than a 1.8 million words. Forrester Research discussed this and put it out into the world. And I thought it was so profound because yes, we realize that the written word versus video is so different. And that one seems to be more popular than the other at any given time for any different reason. But the actual ability to influence is so much higher when we are using all of the senses. So that is a really important thing to remember when it comes to video and how do we use all of those senses to get our point across. I also want you to think about this from a retention standpoint. Consumers are more likely to retain images than written content, kind of going back to that last point. Evidence suggests that we remember 60% of information for longer when we see an image. At Aftermark, we deal a lot with helping our customers make a greater impact than they've been able to do with just writing or blogging or social posting, making those senses pay attention to what the effort of our client is. SAP is a customer that we have worked with at Aftermark, and that was a really big thing for them. With SAP, they knew that they were not making as much of an impact as they wanted to for small business. And that's probably because as a really big software company, small businesses were not thinking, oh, we should call up SAP, right? We Most situations, a small business is thinking, I'm not there yet, I'm not ready at that point, I'm not ready to scale, we're not big enough yet, that is not for us yet. But some are a lot closer, if not there, before they realize it. So educating them was important, but we had to do it in a way that made sense to them. The series that we came up with for SAP to help do this through video is called Life At. And we literally just looked at their customers and said, who is a small business on that scale that is working with SAP and how can we share their story? How can we show what life at their organization is like? Because what better for another business who is thinking that they need to do things a little bit more efficiently than for someone to look at another business that looks like them and see behind the scenes what's happening? What is their organization? What do they do? How large is their customer base? Uh, and, and things along those lines where we talked about that in this series. Now, of course, we had to be careful of that. You want to go, you don't want to go too deep into like the weeds of software. Cause I don't know if you've heard, but software is not that fun to talk about all of the time. You really have to make it make sense. You have to tell real stories and talk about real impact. So while we were doing this, in an effort to promote a product, we were telling a story that would make sense to the average person who's trying to figure out if the solution is right for them. So in your situation, you probably can see that video is gonna make a big difference, but how do we get clients to care? How do we get them to step on up and say, yes, we need this, you're the ones to help us with this. How can we make sure that this makes sense to them specifically in how we are positioning it for their particular situation. My advice for this is show to tell. This is the biggest thing in my opinion when it comes to video. Why video? Why all the senses? The best way that you can make sure that you are making the most out of the experience is to show to tell. And in this situation in particular, when you educate through video, you advocate for video. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that 100%, 100% of my clients in either of my businesses has found us because of video that we have created. It's not always about what our solutions are. It's not always about what our products are, but it is helpful. And the biggest way we've got, we're getting people to talk about video is to simply have them watch one. If you're watching this, if you've got something useful out of it, if it's within the realm of territory of things you're thinking about in your situation, because we're trying to put ourselves in your place so we can help you so that maybe you'll remember who we are when you're thinking about a solution that we provide, we're going to do that with video form. We do it in a lot of other forms as well, but in video production, clearly that's that's what we're leading with. So if you are an agency and you are thinking, guys, let's round up the strategy for video for our clients. Let's look at the different options that we can have available. Let's add this to our menu of services, but you're not doing it. 
you are not showing to tell. You are at a significant disadvantage. And if you can't break down your own barriers within your walls of how you can best share your message as a brand with video, then that's probably gonna be a little bit more difficult of a conversation for you to have with your clients in the long run. So now that you're prepared, let's talk about some key questions to ask when you're sitting down with your potential client or your current client trying to figure out what their video needs are. First, what does success look like? It's a basic question. We've heard it a million times, but it's a very important one because if you need to get those real measurable results that your client is expecting out and in the open, so we really know what kind of video is going to make sense for them, what does success look like? Is it conversion of customers? Most of the time, yes, that's what everyone's going for. But they may also be doing a more high level brand awareness campaign. We've got to decide what is the main biggest thing that we can do here to make sure we are choosing the right path and the right action plan for what video is going to be best in this situation. This also is going to help you a ton with focusing your scope of work. Video, I'll just let you know, is so everywhere. It's visuals, it's audio, it's editing, it's transitions, it's graphics, it's voiceover. It, there's a lot that goes into it. There's sometimes even travel involved. So with all of that being said, having a messy scope of work because we weren't clear on what those results are hoping to be so that we can keep things aligned. Uh, it, it gets really difficult when people lose sight of where we were supposed to be going with this. Once you see video and you see the opportunity and you see the possibility of making it better and perfectionism, it can be very easy to just keep asking for changes and keep going with different ideas, but we've got to keep the best successful result in mind. The next question I would ask is, why video? Same question I led with. Why video? Or better yet, why live video? Because a lot of companies I have noticed in my career, when live video became very popular on different platforms for different reasons, wanted to go down that road, but didn't actually have a unique idea that would make live make sense. Or their idea was for video, but when you actually heard it out and what it could have been, Maybe it was just good enough as a podcast. Maybe it was better as a podcast. Maybe it wasn't any of those things at all. So really the question here is why video? How are we going to work in all the senses? Or how are we gonna leverage the features for the right reasons? With live video, it needs to be interactive. And I know all of us here are thinking about that right now because of the context that we're in. If it's not interactive, it really can just be on demand. So going into the live venue, we have to have clear objectives and why we're gonna make the most of it, but why video at all? How are we gonna make it a visually interesting experience, brainstorm that visual appeal and leverage the features again for the right reasons a couple of really important questions to ask but the most important question to ask is who are you talking to who are we talking to if we don't know who is at the other end of that video who's watching at home who's watching on their phone on their computer on their television or wherever it happens to be why are they watching it because who are they we have to be able to step into those shoes and we also need to watch for those conversations specifically with our clients when they say we have many different types of clients we have these buyers we have these other people over here we have those who buy wholesale and it can get really messy really quick and you lose sight of what success looks like because you lose sight of who the audience is that would directly tie into that success metric. And then we're just doing something for everybody. And as I know, everyone in the agency world knows you can't make something for everybody. We're certainly gonna, not gonna do that with video, but we can hit the target board in a few different ways as long as we know what that center target is. Is. So now that we've kind of unpacked that, let's go into brainstorm mode. Here are five simple ideas for your video campaign. The first is storytelling. I talked about an example in the beginning that was very, very good storytelling. And this is really the heart of many brands, sharing the success stories. Let your work speak for itself or your client's work. How can you display that in a way that contextually is interesting for the audience you're hoping it will hit? And again, show to tell stories. Don't just tell the story show to tell it let the potential customers see themselves in that story 
The second idea is streaming, and this goes into video, live video, of course, but we've got to create those interactive real moments if we are going to stream. If we're expecting people to come to a live event, maybe it's because we are taking the place of a previously live event that's no longer in person and now it is online. How can we still generate that energy? How can we still create connections with people? Why are we going to make this interactive and very real time so people will show up at the time and place we want them for that campaign? And it also allows the team to connect industry leaders to the community. This is an opportunity to spotlight the people who work for the organization and maybe an influencer or a celebrity or an industry leader of some kind of thought leader to be a part of the conversation within that stream, whether it's one live event or a larger one. Again, very similar situation to where we are right now. How can you leverage streaming to make connections and be very interactive? The third idea is sponsoring. You can absolutely let the creatives be the creatives. Let the creatives be creative for you. Can you attach your name to someone who has done an amazing job at what they do for a community you can also serve? Connect with loyal tribes and lift up their leaders. That is ultimately what you're doing when you become a sponsor. And also allowing your product to become relevant in a larger conversation. What is that larger mission of the influencer or the show that you are working with? How do you want to be aligned with it? Why do you believe in it? Why did you do your homework that it makes sense that your product would be a part of this conversation. Sponsoring is much more than plastering your logo, your services, and your product in places that have eyeballs. It is you saying, I believe in this person so much that I would partner with them. And that speaks volumes as well. And it also is very smart on your end to be able to apply as much of your resources toward getting attention, not just the production in addition to attention. Number four, servicing. This, to me, customer service is the best, best video we can see out there. Meet your customer where they are today and do something to offer them a service, no strings attached. You might call them tutorials or how-to videos if you teach them what they want to know. Provide that service, allow people to know that you will be here for them, even if they're not a customer for you right now. Can you teach someone how to paint something and then maybe also mention you happen to sell the paint? But first and foremost, give them the knowledge that they need to be able to make that purchase decision at some point. Providing a service is huge. Your product may not be the content, but it can absolutely be a part of the solution. If the content is good enough and you come at it from an audience first mentality, that will be an excellent video. You will have really attentive eyeballs and ears on that information. And then ultimately they look to you to be the thought leader at the end of the day and say, okay, well, now that I know that, what do I do next? That's where you get to let people know how they can help you help themselves. And number five, socializing. The best part of social media and video and all of the platforms today is that we want to let the community be a part of this journey. We don't have to stand on our soapbox and create the whole thing from scratch. Let the community tell you what they want. Ask, ask your community, what do they need help with? What's the best thing you could create for them? What would be the, the most important thing that they saw today in their industry that you could help lead the way to connect them to? And again, I, I really mean it when I say, there's always something that you can listen to to take a note from. You may feel you have an, a quiet audience or one that isn't to where you need it to be yet for them to tell you what to do and what to create and run a poll with them and it seems like crickets. If no one is listening, seek out the opportunities to listen. It is not fair to the internet to say that it is very noisy and very saturated and your competitors are all over the place doing whatever they're doing and also say no one is listening, no one is telling us what to create. People are sharing their opinions nonstop. Your target audience is sharing their information, their needs, their wants, their questions, their stresses, uh, their sadness all day long all over the internet. How can you leverage 
all of that information, even if it's not being directed toward your client or toward you, but to someone very similar, where are the question marks in that comment section? How did that video not totally close the loop that your client can do better? Find the opportunities to listen so you know where you where to step in and have an amazing starting point. By far and away, user-generated content is the best way to start a relevant conversation. Q and A's are awesome. Just simply looking for what people are sharing online so you can pull them together and stitch a story that emulates why you do what you do and how you help. It is very easy to socialize video if you are listening. Everyone always asks, what do you do if your client is not great on camera? Or what do you do if it's just not quite good enough for the final edit? How do you educate someone to really make the viewer feel like they're in the room, like they're with a comfortable, trusted friend. How do you have that impact? How do you become someone that is so good on camera that everyone says, you're so good on camera? It is not because you're born with it. I can promise you that from my own personal life experience, my mom still cannot find any photos of me as a child. I exaggerate, but also it's kind of true. I hid from the camera a lot. It is not something you're born with it. You. It is not something you're born with. You become better on camera when you are clear on who you're talking to. You become better on camera when your mission matters. You become clear on camera when there is a clear objective and a clear idea of what success looks like. You become better on camera when you talk to someone you know well enough that this video is going to be a solution for them. That is how you get better on camera. You do not get better by psyching yourself up. You don't get better making yourself think you're talking to millions of people because that's way too much pressure. You don't get better when you think everyone that's watching this is judging you. You get better when you solve problems. And when you look at the camera, like you are about to make someone's day from a generous place, not from a cocky place, okay? So if you or someone you know needs coaching, help them identify who they're talking to from how, what color their hair is, to how they commute to work, to what their biggest stresses are, to what keeps them up at night, to what kind of emails they get. What is their life like? Because if you can stand in those shoes for five minutes, your video will be better than every competitor you have. 100%. Thank you so much for your time. Really looking forward to having an excellent Q and A with everybody. Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, thanks Amy for a great presentation. And Amy, let's bring you up here and we'll start our Q&A. Hello everybody, what's up Chip? Not much, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, very excited to be here. Hopefully that was helpful and we can dive in a little bit deeper for everybody. For sure, I thought it was great, so thank you. Hey, for those who don't know you well, Amy, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am the founder of Aftermark. It's a video production company that I founded with my husband. We really focus on serving companies that want to tell their story through video. Uh, we're able to do that in a number of different ways. I talked about it in this presentation here. Storytelling, uh, live streaming, online events. There's definitely um, a few things that we specialize in. Lately, it's really been online events. So that's kind of one side of my life. Uh, I also own a company called Gatlu House where I'm a success coach. So I really help ambitious women who are going after their full-time freedom and talking about what that looks like for them to lead a productive lifestyle. Good Morning, Good Life is my second book. Um, my first book is Blog Like a Boss. So there's definitely a few areas that I like to talk about with people, mostly having to do with getting your message out there and sharing it with the world so that you can go after the life you want. That's great. So I, a lot of people don't get to have sort of an insight into the people that they watch on YouTube. You know, they wonder, how did this person get to become who they are? So take us through that journey a little bit. You know, how and why did you get involved in YouTube so early? Just update us all. It wasn't a master plan, I can tell you that. When I, when I started on YouTube, it was one of those things that you didn't tell people 
<laughs> it was, you're kind of in the closet a little bit on it because it was really a creative outlet for me. I was asked to be in a wedding uh, in 2007 and I just came up with an idea to make something special for the bride and it was a video and I played it at the rehearsal dinner and without going into the whole story, there was just, it was a very simple video, but it was really extraordinary what the power was of it when it was played for an audience of people. And I think I not only finally observed a creative outlet, but that you really could hold the emotions of people in your hand with the right story. And I found that fascinating. So I wanted to learn more about it. Um, I wasn't good on camera as I talked about in the presentation. I just was something I was passionate about was editing and sharing my message. So I just started practicing and, and started uploading because the first video I ever made was on a DVD and that was not really sustainable or effective. I found YouTube because it was easier to share my videos on. And then I discovered a whole community there, people who are telling stories that seem so sim simple, but looked amazing because you have to make it interesting. You have to make the average thing kind of interesting so you can show people your world. So that was really how I got started. Um, to connect the dots a little bit, I was just documenting my life. But what I didn't realize was that I was also learning a skill, a skill that would become very, very important to a lot of businesses over the long haul. And I don't think that's any secret to anybody here. We're no longer asking, do I have to do Facebook or do I have to make video? Um, we now know it's the norm. We now know that it's what our customers want. It's just a matter of how we fit into that. So as I learned that I was learning something that was much grander than just me having fun, uh, I, I slowly but surely chugged away at building my own business and uh, becoming an expert in the field and helping businesses to be able to do the same thing. Got it. Well, you seem comfortable on camera now, for sure. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so I, I think a, a lot of people, it might be kind of daunting, you know, even if you're an agency and you're doing video today for some of your customers, right? There's there's fewer people in the world that are you know, trying to build a huge presence on YouTube. And I think mm -hmm. I mentioned you have about 400,000 subscribers to Amy TV. And, you know, again, that seems daunting. Well, I can never get there. But it, talk about how you got there you know was there sort of a big bang was it a steady kind of growth just talk more about that absolutely so to start um amy tv was really the place where i went to start talking about business with my audience it, my initial joining of youtube was more fun when i realized you know i'm leaving my job i'm going into business full time for myself, I need a place where we can convene and talk about this on this, you know, like minded topic. So uh, that's how the channel was launched. And it was a very, very slow growth. Honestly, like I just focused on who my audience was. And it was a very specific person. And I only cared about serving that person on a consistent basis. And I did that. And um, so it, it definitely was a, a slow growth. Um, while in 2018, things kind of escalated uh, after a, a decade, things escalated in 2018. And um, it, it became a little bit more widespread, a little bit more mainstream because of sort of what we've been talking about more lately, which is in my second book, the idea of productivity and making the most of your time and living your best life while doing your best work. Um, so uh, it, we, we certainly tripled quickly uh, in 2018, but it wasn't, it was definitely not a, 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 just because I uploaded three times a week for three years without missing an episode that subscribers came running. The, the bar was higher than that. The people I wanted in my community were very specific. And so I had to make sure I was only serving them and so yeah it was a little bit slower so it's definitely a testament to the fact that you can make a huge difference in your business and that number not be the end all be all i think we have to consider algorithms to a certain degree in terms of what they're doing for us and how we can leverage them better but it is certainly not the whole story right well you're a, you're a two-time author right of good morning good life and also vlog like a boss and so i know that you've created a formula for what makes a great video. Do you wanna talk more about that? Yeah, and I just wanna point it out because I, I wanna explain it, but um, it is in Vlog Like a Boss, the book, and it is displayed. I just feel like it's a little bit easier when you're following along looking at it. I wish I would like brought it 
to your attention earlier. But I do want to share this because my goal with this was I want people to feel like they can sit down and sit in front of a camera. Let's say it's with your client or it's in house, whatever the case. I want you to feel like you're making the best possible video you can at this moment. Can a personality get better? Of course. Can you be more practiced? Can you fine tune as you go? Absolutely. But if you sit down and only have a very loose objective as to what you want to accomplish and you're just trying to get a video done and hoping it turns out okay, um, I think we can do better than that. So the formula was meant for somebody who can sit down and say like, okay, as long as I hit these markers throughout the process of this video, then all together, once it's all said and done, we're, we're good to go. So the first thing is subject first. Subject first means that, you know, when you joined here, you were welcomed by someone. Chip said hello. You know, you immediately connected with a person. And I think that's very important because we want to connect with people. We don't do business with brands and logos. We do business with people. So when we're leveraging video, we don't want to hide behind all the craziness. We want to make sure that the person that is connecting and guiding us through this process are, is, is right front and center. Um, loyalty treatment is in tandem with that. You know, welcoming people into the experience, whether they're new or not, treat everyone like they've been a loyal viewer for years. Uh, this will help you to skip the inevitable, difficult elevator pitch that you try to get through because you feel like you need to say hello for your first episode and it just becomes a little bit bumpy. If you just really dive into making good on what the promise of the episode is or what the video is or what the live stream is, they're gonna be really interested in who you are and what the heck they just signed up for later on, but you wanna deliver really, really quickly. That it brings me to the eight second rule. I, YouTube is very generous. People on average decide to leave or stay around the eight second mark. <laughs> that's generous. That may, At this point, that's probably uh, even maybe a couple seconds off on Facebook, we don't even really get that same interaction, right? You don't get audio and video at the same time. When you're experiencing a video on Facebook, you get the video only, and then you decide if you want to opt in. So the decision-making process to stay or leave is very different there. So with YouTube specifically, what is, or anywhere you're posting, what is the decision-making process to watch the video? And at what point do they decide it's worth their time or not? That's why we really care about things like loyalty treatment, getting your subject first in there as, as quickly as you can. Um, the branding piece, I always say minimal branding, but I mean that in terms of if you're going to do a title sequence, making it really, really quick. Um, or if you're going to do anything that's very commercial at the beginning, have it be a logo on someone's shirt or just in a lower third rather than wasting a lot of the early time of the video for somebody to be able to engage what they came here for. If you knock out a lot of that stuff at the beginning, if you do most of those things, you will hopefully have someone stay beyond your introduction and really get the information they came for, at which point you need to be generous. Generous is not free. Generous is not lack of focus, but delivering on what you said you were going to in the title or in the description of what people decided to opt into is very important because if they don't get everything that they want, they'll go find it somewhere else. They'll go to your competitor. They'll go to somebody that's doing it better. You don't want that to happen. You've got their attention now. So you need to be generous. It doesn't mean you have to give it all away. Like I said, it's not free. That's what your the end of your video is coming up for very quickly. Um, you'll be able to make good on all of that stuff that you delivered. But always remember to be generous. Speak to the camera like it's an individual, not like it's a crowd. We talked about that in the presentation. So really important to keep that in mind. Then you get to the end and, and your end is very importantly, not an afterthought. You know, you just delivered, you just offered something. If people stayed, they wanted it. They're excited. You're their thought leader. They need to know now, where do we go from here? So really incorporating an appropriate amount of time at the end for a call to action, because everyone that's there just needs to know what's next. What's the next natural step here and making it very audible and clear. If you can display it on screen, if you say it at the same time and it's coming from your mouth, a totally different thing than a link that's in the description that nobody knew about unless they poked around there. Really making it absolutely clear, what should people do once they've completed this experience? Where do they go next? And then I always tell people to keep the timing marker in mind. Let's say you are creating a YouTube video. That is the goal. What are you up against? What's in the search results? What 
other company or other person created a video similar to what you're going to do? How long did it take them to do it? Do you want to be the guy that's 15 minutes when there's a three minute option? Really keeping in mind, how long should the call to action be and the introduction based on how much content you have to give and say, oh, okay, let's stay at the five minute mark so we can really prove we can deliver in a short period of time. Get people signed up to be subscribed so that it's very bingeable and easy to stay tuned for. These, I, I went over them very quickly. Again, they're easily looked at in the book. Um, but if you hit these markers, even if you're not the best person on camera, you know, take a break, look at your notes and say, okay, at this next point, we need to say this, we need to just look at the camera like it's a person. So take the breaks to look at your notes as you need. If you follow that formula, you will always make the best video you possibly could have made at this point in time. It's not about the camera. It's not about the equipment. It is about delivering your message efficiently in a way that is worth it for the person that is watching it. So that's that's the formula. I'm hoping that's really helpful to people who are trying to figure out, you know, how do we just get started, but not waste any of the content that we make in the early days. Yeah, no, I think it's a great formula. And speaking of that formula, I want to make sure that we're generous and uh, and on topic for the session for why many people will be here. So, you know, the title of this session is selling video services to clients, right? So, what specifically do you have? What kind of advice do you have for agencies that want to do a better job of selling video services to their clients? I think the biggest thing is that, that video, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but video is a very large department. And you're going to have different video companies that you end up working with for your clients or, or for various reasons that specialize in different things. Or if you're specializing in those things in-house, what are they? Be really clear about that. Because just because someone knows how to run a camera over in the storytelling department, doesn't necessarily mean that they're as good as the guys that can run an incredibly smooth live event online. So making sure you're very clear on what the uh, what the objective is, what the success factor looks like, what are the KPIs here? You want to have the right scope in front of you. When you're selling that to a client, it's really easy to say, oh, we want to host a live event. Can you do it for us? Awesome. Great. Cool. We love to. Great. But if you lose track of all of the things that can pop up, what about the social shareables? Or well, what are we gonna do for the replay? And there's a lot of editing that gets involved and there's a lot of repurposing opportunity. It needs to be abundantly clear when you are pitching those services, what you really have in front of you because your client may not know what to ask of you. They just know they gotta do video and you may be the one telling them that. Really understanding because you are their agency what have they been trying to accomplish? How are we going to best do that? What is the best tactic? And then really making good on what that what that really looks like from a scope standpoint. Um, it can get messy in video because there are so many things more you can do once you have the content, which is great. But uh, I know agencies feel me here when they hear me say the word scope creep. We, do, we wanna be careful of that. We wanna make sure that we're aware of what we're selling and not the assumptions of what we're selling. Great, yeah, and Amy, you're probably seeing these come in as well. There's a lot of great questions being, being chatted in. And so, you know, one I think is super relevant, especially for some of the smaller agencies that we work with. And Grant here asks, you know, what are some inexpensive tools that we can use for SMB clients with a lower barrier to entry for quick wins with video? You know, I mean, it looks, daunting and expensive to some people and you know absolutely what, what are your thoughts there yeah absolutely i mean the smallest things can really up upgrade mm -hmm. a, a situation right so with inexpensive you're, you're probably going to need to figure out the editing factor right post-production tends to be one of the biggest things where if you need to outsource that there's some costs that get involved if it's something you can do within the agency maybe you're able to save money on that front with how you're selling it but if we're talking about equipment, I mean, it's really fascinating what we're learning in, in 2020 specifically is that you can do a lot with the cameras that you have available to you. The majority of the time when someone asks me, what's what camera should I get? What to, well, listen, you can go and buy my camera. That's great. It's going to cost you a lot. And that's OK, too, if you're going to use it and you know how to use it, especially in an agency client situation 
we uh, we will ship out inexpensive webcams and microphones and things that our clients need, even if they're some of the largest companies in the world and they they want to save money on this front. But training always becomes a factor. How do you sit in front of the camera? How do you set it up? How do you light it properly? And the easiest thing to do is use the tools that they already know how to work. Do they know how to work their Zoom camera? Do they know how to work their smartphone? Can we put them in front of a window? Can we help them set up so it looks acceptable? This has become much more frequent practice of late because of the uh, pandemic and not, not being able to go to your video studio and not being able to have your video guy come and coach you through it. And it's some of the most talented and well-spoken executives in the world. They still need to be walked through this process, nice camera or not. So I think on that front, tools can mean a lot of different things. So let me know if we can um, maybe get more specific, but uh, we were just saying this to a relative the other day, an aspiring YouTuber um, in my husband's family in, in you know, middle school, like, hey, what do, what do I get? Uh, use, your, use your iPhone. It is one of the best video cameras on the market, and you actually know how to use it. <laughs> That's amazing. And that, getting better, too. Yeah. It's hugely important that you just know how to use it. And you step up the little things. You get the Bluetooth microphone through your AirPods, or you can get one that's wired and attached, and you just sit close enough so that it's not um, it's not as much of a variable. But if you're in a room that's small with carpet, there's things on the wall, and there's not a lot of sound bouncing around, you may not even need that. You just might need to sit in front of a window, testing it, sit the camera up and test it, send us the file, we'll give you feedback. It's really a lot of the times just going through those steps with equipment that already exists, tools that already exist in our clients' lives. Yeah, I think that that builds on what you had said about just you know, user generated content, you know, and so I, I think I know your answer to this question, but there's some questions coming in about the advantages of using like a video production company. Um, you know, and then uh, Sue Vash here asks, you know, what would you say is most important value versus production? But uh, I'd love to get your take on that. You know, these days, it really is, it really is value, but the production level is is so uh, the bar is high because people are still yeah. shooting the most elegant stories again with a phone. So I think there's a couple of different pieces to it. Um, there are times I, I shoot myself all the time, right? I'm using my webcam now. I have a, a video camera for YouTube, but there are times where I can only take on so much headspace that uh, that will get a really well done video done. And so I will call a production, I have a, a, a video guy and I have him come shoot for me on those days where it's like, I, I very low resources here. I had to come up with the creative. I have to execute the creative. I have to talk about it. I have to, I have to be on. And so really depending on how much we are bootstrapping here, um, I know what that's like. And even owning a video company, I'll still hire a video production specialist to come and help me because it is really important that I can elegantly explain my point and not get flustered about how the camera is set up. And so of course, this is this is really useful for anybody who's in business and maybe is not good at video and already has to get it through their mind that they have to sound good and sound believable and talk to somebody on camera. There's a lot of responsibility there. So uh, that, that was kind of a rant because it could be any which problem, depends on who the person is. But with the challenge being that you have to be able to show up, talk to the camera, focus on the person so well that they walk away saying, wow, that was great. Whatever you have to do to set the personality up for success on that front is hugely important. That's super helpful. You know, um, so many questions here, just trying to pick what's most valuable potentially to the audience. We might not get to, to most of them. You know, what we've done, by the way, historically, and some of these series is we'll, we'll provide these to you via email afterwards. We can kind of answer them together and we'll get them published somewhere for attendees. How's that sound? Sounds good. <laughs> good. good. Yeah, yeah. So um, a question just came in on the chat that, I, that I'm looking at from Pete Webb, you know, and so when you're thinking about if you're an agency, you know, how many new skills would you need to onboard? You know, it seems like there are more than a few, you know, you have writers, you have designers, to, you know, talk about the, the range of people you need to to do this well. 
Yeah, sure. I think, you know, at a basic level, you you need somebody who's leading creative. And this could be the person that's already kind of tag, uh, tagging in on the client work at all, right? Is fully aware of what success looks like, knows what they have been um, working on toward getting done for the client. And now they're incorporating in video and understanding how these pieces and parts work together. You've got to have somebody on creative. Um, and, and then also working with the personality in terms of how are you going to execute the content? Do you need a script? If you need a script, what does that logistically look like? Um, you're going to need somebody to be tagged in on that. The post-production tends to be the biggest feat, right? So you need video editing expertise. Um, that video editor needs graphics, needs, um, needs design. And there's a lot of it that's possible to purchase. Um, you can buy plugins, you can definitely do a number of different things. But it, it might also be that you need a graphic designer to level up the content a little bit and be able to say, hey, we need to pay somebody to come up with what is going to be best for this series. So we have a specific design for this series. It Again, it, you can really start with less than that. We have so many tools available to us. There are apps that are helping us come up with graphics now. There's tools that already come on the computer that we bought at the store that we can edit with and we can buy plugins to upgrade how pers uh, personalized it looks for the brand. Um, there's a number of the different things that you can do. Design, graphic design, video editing, um, video production itself, actually capturing the content. Um, are definitely the biggest ones, but having somebody to be creative and say, here's what we're doing and here's how we do it well and how we make sure all of the pieces and parts work together. I think that role is very important with the agency. That's great. So, you know, I, I'm guessing that there are a lot of people in, uh, that are wondering about, you know, how to use video, video in different areas, right? It might be YouTube, it might be via email, um, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one in a B2B setting, you know, so I'm guessing the answer is it depends in terms of the best length for video. But um, do you have some ways that you think about video length and how you approach it yourself or how you recommend people think about it? Um, what do you mean by video link? Length, sorry, the how oh, long length. video. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So with, and you know what? Yes. That's a, that, that is a challenging thing, right? So on one hand, Facebook, right? You, people see the video when they're making a decision to watch it. So the, the, it's very quick. You've got to be really quick, get people in, start it off strong, get people interested, right? Keep them on board. Minutes watched is the most important thing to most of these platforms. They want to see that not only did you have a project that people wanted to see, but they stayed, they watched it, they continued to watch it. Um, in, in YouTube land, very, very important, right? So I made a video, I want you to watch it. Of course, I want you to watch more videos on my channel. But in fact, if I get you to continue to watch in general, and you keep watching on YouTube, no matter where you're watching, that's a positive impact for me, because it means I bring users to the platform. So the worst thing that we can do is bore somebody into leaving because algorithmically that's not going to be helpful for us. Um, and keeping attention is, it's a high, it's a high bar. So uh, I would say that you should deliver as quickly as possible. That's the biggest thing. And the length of uh -huh. the actual video, it just depends on where you are. You never really wanna have a one minute video on YouTube because they count watch time. So one view equals one minute. That's not gonna get you anywhere exponentially. But if you have a solid five minute video with one view on it, that's five minutes of watch time. And again, more views exponentially grows. Whereas on Instagram, in some places, you only get a minute, you get a maximum of a minute. So it really depends on where you're posting. Um, and regardless, if you can't get somebody past the 30% mark of whatever that timing marker is, you missed the mark on how to get somebody to stay engaged. We tend to look at our audience retention on YouTube as a fairly good success rate of averaging 50%. If you can stay for 50% or longer, if you can keep your audience for at least 50% on average or longer, then you produced a pretty good project and um, you can continue to tweak things to help it perform better. But if you couldn't even get somebody to, to that point, it might 
it might be dead and you just got to move on to the next one. So I think it's trial and error. It depends on the format. If it's a podcast, clearly we're not talking about five minutes most of the time. But again, it, it, it depends on where you're posting, what the format is and how well you deliver in a short period of time for your target audience. Yeah, that, that is great advice. Hey, Amy, uh, I'm going to take a detour here real quick and, and put my sponsor hat on and, and talk about what's coming up next in the series, you know, so we can bring a few Perfect. slides up. Uh, so next week, we've got, you know, agency industry luminary Carl Sakis. So 12 to not next week, sorry, that's in two weeks after the Thanksgiving holiday here in the US. And if you've heard Carl before, he's phenomenal. So he's an agency business expert, keynote speaker, et cetera, with just phenomenal. Uh, you know, information on running an agency and making your ops work better. Um, and then we have more great stuff coming up uh, in the weeks after that. Bringing this year home for us is Seth Godin on 1210. Huge fan of Seth Godin. I've followed him for like, yikes, 20, over 20 years probably. And, you know, I'm old <laughs> for sure because I've been following Seth for that long. Um, and, you know, two more things. So remember, uh, you know, Amy shared her video uh, formula from Vlog Like a Boss. You can get a copy of that book, a signed copy from Amy. All you need to do is click on the link that we're going to put there in the chat. We'd love to show you why over 2,000 agencies and 10,000 businesses grow their revenues with SharpSpring. And the final slide that we'll show you here is, uh, you know, sharpspring.com slash Amy survey, you can tell us about how we are doing on this series. And we've enjoyed having Amy and we're going to get back to a few more questions here, uh, Amy, before we cut off for the day. So um, th this this one was chatted in. And uh, I, I think it's great. Um, I, I'm trying to find it again, it may have dropped down below for me. But somebody talked about how much t uh, how do you spend your time preparing to do a video like you typically do? You know, how much time do you recommend people think through the content and the storyboarding and, you know, testing and trialing and just, do you just leave the camera run and then edit it or do you, how do you do it? So I, there's, I think it depends on, uh, on what the actual video is, but let's just, let's just say cut and dry. We, we got, we get a question frequently, so we're going to make a video about it. Awesome. Um, I would, I would first thing, really go to where you're going to post and see, you know, has anyone done this before? You know, what does it look like when this has been done in the past? Um, in, in On YouTube, what I like to do is go and see, you know, what are the search results for this? And I like to see what people have done in terms of videos, not because I'm going to do something similar, but to see like, how can I make sure I continue to close the loop better on this? Like, did anybody, you know, was anybody left hanging? Like, what is this, what does the landscape look like for answering this question right now? Also, by doing that, you're going to be able to tap into a little bit of SEO power. YouTube being the second largest search engine in the world, we want to make sure that our videos are equipped to be discovered. So what? how did people phrase their titles and what's the most elegant way to get this out there? What should we do for our thumbnail? This should all really be planned in advance because it's the most important step. If you sit down and shoot the video and it's great, but you didn't really think about how do we make sure it's the right title so that people register immediately what it is? How do we put the visual in front of them to see if they can make that connection, that human connection on the person that's going to deliver this for them? If if you never get the title and thumbnail right, nobody ever clicks to watch it. So the video itself is kind of pointless. Again, that's YouTube. It's different on Facebook. It's different on Instagram. Where are you going to post? What does it tend to look like when people post like this? And then what I like to do is sit down and knowing all of that information, outline the project. So I want to sit down and say, well, how am I going to answer this question? What are all the different areas I want to cover? But I don't script it so much as I bullet point it out. Because like I said before, I want to look at the camera and talk. I don't want to be trying to memorize something that won't come off very authentic. And I, I should know what I'm talking about if I'm the expert in this field. So I want to be able to speak very authentically. So I'm just giving myself a really rough outline and saying, you know, look at my formula. Here's how I'm going to hit the formula. Here's how I'm going to be generous with the content sit down and shoot and that's it film the whole video you know a, a typical situation for me would be a 10 minute video is typically around 20 to 25 minutes of 
just sitting and talking to a camera straight. If a video is more complicated than that, obviously shooting some B-roll and getting some other factors, um, not really including that. I guess I'm just talking about the raw content itself. Um, and then editing it down so that it doesn't take too long for me to get to my point, cutting out all of the breaks, cutting out all of the flubs, and just adding some graphics from there. So the preparation, it just depends on the topic, depends on your expertise. But for me, I, I, you know, I only talk about things I know really well. So I do a little bit of research, takes about a half an hour, and I sit down and outline, takes another half an hour to an hour, depending on how complicated the video is, and I'm ready to sit down and film. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm muted. Sorry about that. Amy, that's that's phenomenal. We're, we're going to leave it there. I know we're almost at the top of the hour. And um, we're just really grateful for your time. I thought the content was great. So thanks again for joining us today. And you know, we're going to try to get to those questions in a blog or something. So if you haven't signed up for the series yet, sharpspring.com slash acceleration, you can do so in the chat. And Amy, uh, you have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Chip. This was great. Thanks, everybody, for your awesome questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. And we're going to bring up the, the one more slide again uh, where you can provide some feedback on the, the series. We'd, we'd love to hear your feedback. And uh, it's really valuable to us. And thanks again for joining us today. Have a good day.